That's just going to leave that as a mystery here yeah. as we kick off episode 11 of the Knockoff Podcast. <laughs> We're back in, back in the studio. It's uh, it's Thursday night, but it feels like a Friday. We Us three boys are headed to uh, Buddy of Ours Bucks Party tomorrow, so the fucking atmosphere is electric. Might as well be a Friday. Fucking oath. Joined in the studio, always, as always, by Chris and Danny. So much shit happening. Straight off the top, I guess, we've got... We're in grand final week for all the uh, the Australian codes. Yeah, yeah. I got to say, I fucking uh, I lost interest halfway through in the in the Raiders and Storm game. It's just uh, probably my two least favorite teams that could have gone through, to be honest. But uh, I'll watch nevertheless. And and Sunday grand finals always always a good one. So we'll get amongst it. The AFLs this week or next week? This week. This Friday. This week. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, grand final weekend, long weekend. Public holiday for it in Victoria. Yeah, yeah. so do, so do we. It's a long weekend for us. So yeah, but I think that's uh, because they moved another public holiday or something, wasn't right. it? It was like it used to be May Day or something, and now Queen's they have. Birthday or something. Yeah, yeah well, so now they celebrate it. It, it in suits October. me to be in this position to be able to go to a Bucks party, two games of footy back to back, and then have the Monday off to recover. I'm, oh, feel, I'm feeling yeah. pretty good about it. But three days recovery is is gold for the for this it. Bucks. Yeah, managed to get a fucking the prediction right with the. Cronulla getting through in the end they were just too much for the Cowboys the Cowboys just shot themselves in the foot but that just came with under they fatigue. just looked so fucking tired man and and I saw a stat that they made like at least twice the amount yeah, of tackles yeah. in that game that fucking Mate, that Cronulla did after 50 53 minutes they'd made 110 more tackles than the Sharks oh and after having to play extra time against the Bronx the week before it ended up being too much so the Sharkies go through Full of confidence now, I think. Mm. And the mm. s- storm have got through, and they talk about sort of fucking media previewing in a state of origin full, like the bunch of Queenslanders on the, yeah, uh, on the Melbourne true. team, that's bunch true. of Blues guys on for Cronulla. Mm. So if you're up here, there's so many people that have jumped on the storm on the back of the Cam Smiths and Cooper Cronks and the like. But I'm uh, I'm tipping the Sharkies to get it done again. It's their, it'll be their first premiership, and uh, if it's if it's going to happen, it's going to be this year. And uh, I'll go on the record again, and I'm I'm saying they're going to get it done. Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, I'll back the storm, but I would I wouldn't be happy. I wouldn't be like you know less happy either way. Uh, I got some cousins that are diehard Cronulla supporters, yeah. so they've been you know fifty years a club and still haven't um, haven't got the premiership yet. So I wouldn't be I wouldn't be mad to see them get it. It's not a bad part of the world down there at Cronulla. My grandparents oh, shit, uh, yeah. used to live at Caring Bar, like in that sort of Sutherland Shire and. Fucking great place to visit. It had been back only a couple of years ago too and, and had a mad time there. Mm. During It would be mad now because it is a one-team little town in there, their own little pocket. Like As we know, with all the shit we've seen that's gone down there, they fucking look after each other and get behind each other. And uh, yeah, go the yeah. Sharkies, I reckon. You know what movie I watched uh, the other night was the Ned Kelly one where uh, Heath Ledger plays Ned Kelly. Have you seen it? Yeah, I I've have. Seen that. And like old school... I guess it would be early 19th century Australia or late 1800s. I, I don't know the exact sort of yeah, I'll, uh, I'll y- year up. of Ned Kelly. Yeah. But um, I was watching it and it's just like, you know, they're riding horses in between these like dirt tracks to different towns and camping out in the bush and shit. And I was thinking... Definitely be 1800s. Could you imagine like... And that was Victoria back in the day. So that would have been country Victoria. But could you imagine going back to the real early sort of settlement times of australia and, and going to you know your cronulla or the S- circular key or those sort of fucking famous places in australia where you know now is just a crazy city sprawl of thousands upon thousands of people like to go back when it was just a one horse town I'd, I'd love that man it'd be awesome with robbers and things like that ned kelly uh when he was caught and killed he was 26 years old yeah yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's phenomenal and, when, and yeah. what what year was that uh that was 1880 1880 yeah, yeah so right 1880 he died yeah right yeah. born in right. 1854 died on the 11th of november 1880 that's crazy yeah. that's yeah, crazy yeah in the last getting everywhere by horse and shit you'd yeah. just be a gun fucking horseman he had a bunch of siblings out here too with him like came from a big family dan kelly kate kelly margaret mm. grace yeah. heath ledger hits that thing out of the park man he does he a, real, a real, real good, good job. Actor. He was a yeah, real good actor. Yeah. And I wonder, like, the, yeah, I always have that conversation about are they su- deemed such a good actor because of yeah. the death or because of their acting achievements? Well, without a doubt, death popularises people, particularly when people die at a young age. You know, you got that 27 Club of Kurt mm. Cobain and Amy Winehouse and uh, Jim James Morrison Dean. Also. Yeah, James yeah. Dean. Tupac. Yeah, Tupac. Yeah. Rest in peace, homie. Exactly, man. <laughs> Tupac is was like... He, was he that age? 
Oh, he was 25. 20, 25 or 26. Yeah. 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 It's cra- two packs a fucking crazy one mm. because the amount of sort of content that the like how prolific he was, the amount oh. of shit that he got out as a 25 year old, mm. how opinionated he was and strong minded. And you see some of those like interviews where it's barely an interview, it's just him ranting like hard, monologue. man. Monologue. <laughs> a full on monologue. Like. Can you imagine if you drop two parks you occur into like the. If he is alive, like they're saying that he is coming back for that Up in Smoke tour and shit. Like Dogs might be so about they to bark are. people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just predicting some shit. But yeah, I think um, uh, Tupac's uh, mother and father were both Black Panthers. So, you know, that that would be a, a huge product of, of that upbringing would be people who are so boisterous about black You know what, though? There's this, um, there's this documentary called uh, fucking... Oh, it escapes me now, but it's like got a heap of footage from Tupac when he was like 16, 17. Mm. And he was actually from quite a well-to-do family and, and an education family. And uh, he was full on into drama and the arts and all that yeah. sort of stuff. And when they, they've they got footage of him talking as a 16, 17 year old, he's quite like almost sort of flamboyant and mm. comes across as quite camp and, and yeah. sort of really like dramatic. And then he stu- and then sort of you see the progression of him throughout the doco until he's like twenty two or twenty three or whatever, and he's like, and then I came to Oakland, and Oakland taught me the game. That's when I learned the game and shit, and that and that's like obviously when he turned into a gangster. But he's taken that sort of like intelligence that he had as like a yeah. you know a drama student or whatever, and and turned it into mad gangster fucking rap man it's yeah, just man, he was just yeah. f- from his early upbringing he just wasn't aware of the struggle mm. like he hadn't heard that and you look at the a lot of the things in sort of professional sports over there where we got athletes taking an e during anthems because they're saying the like you've got Amer- african-american athletes over there saying that they're get being suppressed so they're standing up and making it be counted and things like that so Imagine throwing Tupac into the mix now, what he would have to say. Oh, oh holy yeah. shit. Do you remember when, when, when Janet Jackson recorded that movie? I forget what the movie was, but Tupac was in it and there was a sex scene that they had to do together and she wanted him to take a HIV test in order to um, in order to do the, the sex scene or whatever. And, and he, refu- really? he refused on the, on the grounds that um, he said, she was well, being look, racist. No, well, he was just like, if I if I have if I'm gonna have sex with Janet Jackson, then you know, then I will take a HIV test. But you know, like I mean, we're gonna play, I'm not, play yeah, pretend. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna play and pretend. I'm not fucking doing a HIV test. Yeah, just, you know? yeah there's no. I'm not penetrating her. Like, yeah. come on. Going yeah. back to that um top okay. topic last week, he would be an insane podcast guest. He would oh, he would have yeah, to be in the top yeah. three, man. Definitely overlooked, <laughs> overlooked him last week. I in yeah, that I, th- listening back to to that episode and, and having the week to ponder on it, there's probably. You know a number of people that uh, that we missed, but I reckon he'd three. be a full full immortal technique spec dude. If you've heard him at Mortal Technique on just things chill, like JRE, sort of. you know he just like fire off a lot of like political sort of yeah yeah propaganda type chat. Yeah, get Conor McGregor and fucking Tupac on a podcast. <laughs> oh, how long have you got, man? Just do twelve hour lock in. Like, look, we're getting. All sorts of different levels here. Yeah. yeah. See, some shit came out about him today, like having personal issues. Is that just like uh, BJ Penn clickbait or? No. I reckon Th- him and D Devlin are off. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that, that's my pick. Going the full TMZ route with yeah, it sort of thing. Absolutely. I, I'm not sure what it means. Like it's it's so easy to speculate on what all sort of different things that it could be. I personally think he's had a, a very busy year and he's going back to back camp, like going essentially back-to-back here with his fight that's been announced against uh, Eddie Alvarez for the lightweight title. He's had yeah, a, a quick turnaround, a big year where he's made 40 mil. And I still think he might be uh, somewhat reeling from being cage-side when that uh, young Brazilian fighter was killed too, I think. That was a while ago though. Now. I, thi- I think it was underestimated a little bit as to what that did to him. Uh, right. and I've, I've heard interviews with Connor saying uh, he felt it difficult because he had... He had trained, uh, he had trained a man to kill someone. You yeah. know what I mean? And there's oh, a sort yeah. of, and be, just being in the room that night. But whether that's just me going down that path or not, I don't yeah. know. But would be I pretty know, wild. He seems to be pretty tight with his missus. He know? did, um, he did post a photo on Instagram last night of him, like with a, either a ciggy or a spliff in his hand and and a bottle of Grey Goose in, in the in the foreground. But I guess I think he was still wearing the suit from the presser. He was, yeah, mm. absolutely, it mm. was. So that that would have been in the evening, somewhat yeah. over there. So, yeah. just but are we five weeks out from that fight now? 
Yeah, five or six. Yeah, yeah. But he's I'm a, sure he's training. He's a, yeah, absolutely. He's a master of mind games too. Yeah, you know, he, that's he, true. He's master of pep- preparation. He could have just like put that out there, like oh, I'm having some personal issues. Yeah. Like I'll throw this Eddie Alvarez this way. Like yeah. But um, yeah, for people who don't know, uh, we should probably discuss that fucking two o five card that's coming up i mean there are cards on on the horizon but uh, we know that a lot of people that listen to this are more more sort of casual fans so if you are inclined to fucking go out and get potentially the best card of all time on, yeah. on paper it 100 percent is it takes mm. on all comers that they've ever done at any point any organization in mixed martial arts or combat sports they've wanted madison square garden for fucking 20 years and they've finally got it, and they haven't messed around with it. Yeah. It, it is unbelievable. If you're going to go, as Danny said, if you're going to go and spend your sixty, this is the one to tune into. They have just absolutely stacked this bitch to the nines. Mm, yeah, definitely, man. From the prelims as well, and then it just sort of added. Hawk announced that uh, Khabib w- Khabib Nurmagomedov. No, oh, Khabib Nurmagomedov. 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 So hard. The Russian uh, Eagle. Yeah, Khabib and uh, Michael Johnson. That's a. Oh, a, yeah. a bad night at the office for MJ. Yeah, well oh, done, yeah. MJ. Back in the winner's circle. Here's Khabib on short notice. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, exactly. fuck. Like, Although, okay. Michael Johnson is a good wrestler in himself too, but and he's, he, uh, he won't he's be able Khabib. to stand uh, Khabib's fucking. But Khabib off. hasn't fought in a fucking while, man. He no, hasn't. He, he, I thought he fought not that. No, man. He's had. Uh, would ha- would have to look that up if. Uh, uh, I want to say it's definitely that. inside, sort of like the last six months. Ooh, no, I reckon no. I reckon it'd be twelve months. For mine, I'll, I'll really? go on record. I'll we'll have to have a look. Yeah, no, I want to say much, much more recent than that. It feels like it's only six or, or something like I that. I know he beat, he crushed a can, essentially. Eh? Yeah, Some guy stepped in on late notice absolutely. against him. I do remember that. No respect, no disrespect to that can, but... Um, <laughs> 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 Daryl Horsher, you know who you are. Shout out. Um, Chris, who you got out of... Chris, you're on the money, man. April 16, 2016. There you go. But before that was April 19, 2014. Yeah. There you go. So yeah. He's there somewhat you know. active, but look, who that's was the guy not being active. In April? Daryl Horsher, a dude, a fellow from another organisation, stood up oh, on, late, okay. on late notice to go and uh, actually hung with him for the second round. Khabib got the uh, TKO finish in the TKO. second. In the second. but uh, Yep. Just heavy ground and pound, and that's yeah, where yeah. you yeah. beat your ass if, uh, if they get... If McGregor is somewhat able to get through Eddie because... Conor McGregor, is there a better first round fighter out there? Other than him and no, Anthony Johnson yeah. come to mind as the best five first round fighters out there. They mm. can just come out and crack with their power at its best. Eric put, Silver, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in two thousand nine, yeah, in two thousand nine, he won last weekend. Actually, did I'm he? Pretty sure, yeah. In a different organization. Yeah. No, no, he's UFC, still, in UFC, oh, really? still in there, but just sort of in the. 15 to 20 sort of rankings for yeah, Eric Silver. But yeah, yeah. if, uh, if he's getting old now, I fucking have watched a bunch of his fights that I've enjoyed, but no, oh, yeah, no, yeah, 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 he definitely goes yeah. out on his sword. Loves yeah. his supplements, loves them. He, loves he got the shit out of him at one, some point. I'm well, swear he did. In that latest fight, did he He looked like a lot more cut up, he at was. least at the weigh ins, than, than he typically looks because he got criticized in his fight before that one. For, for having that sort of real dad bod mm. stuff. Yeah, look, <laughs> looking soft. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but he, uh, he had an absolute war with mm. Matt Brown that yeah. was exciting as fuck. That's that right. Was, yeah. That was awesome. Don't, yeah, yeah. Oh, a fucking oath yeah. it was. That was a good one if you got fight past Matt Brown versus fucking old mate. But um, yeah, if it, somehow back to like the 155 pound title fight, if Connor is somehow able to put Eddie away and Khabib wins on the, that night, Jose Aldo, he, it's he's Connor ain't going back back to forty five. No, no, but Khabib is a fucking nightmare for Connor. Yeah. for mine, I yeah. think he really is. Yeah. He was able to, in a five round fight against Rafael dos Anjos, took him down something like fifteen to twenty times in mm. that fight. Just took him down at will. And you're talking a guy was probably one of the best ground games at one fifty five. Yeah, I, n- I know that, but like then then you get those that model of fighter that that almost reach that level where they need to progress because you know like Chael Sonnen followed the same model of everybody knew that he was going to bum rush them and and try and just throw them to the ground, but then at, at some stage everyone's prepared for it enough to the fact that it starts becoming ineffective mm. and and you know and, and Khabib's going to have to evolve that game to include a really good striking game and shit because otherwise people are just going to drill takedown D and eventually they're just going to be able to you know mm. hold him off long enough to to throw shots yep. and shit like that what people is he like on the feet I have 
I know all about okay. all his ground, but only because he takes it there. He's yeah. able to dictate where the fight goes. He's got that Ben Askren sort of yeah. strength, feel man. about he just him. Seems so he's so strong, like thin. that that and he, and he's natural in the, strength. He would be in the gym every day with Kane Vela- Velasquez, Velasquez yeah. Cormier, yeah. and Rockhold, and yeah. he would. <coughs> At 155, he'd probably walk around about 180 pounds. Yeah, he would hang absolutely. with those guys. Oh, I, I don't, I don't doubt that at all. And uh, it, for him to get through Johnson, but it's just so many fights on that 205 car that they've got. I mean, you can break down fucking Chris McGregor. Weidman, Yoel Romero. Oh, yeah. Who you got there? Oh, I've, I'm a I'm a Weidman fan, so I'd, I'd, Weidman gets it done for me. But me uh, look, Yoel is just so dangerous. I'd love to see Yoel start him. There's potential there for that to happen. Absolutely, there really is. If both of those guys grappling around on the floor, like wow, we that anything could happen in that fight. Yeah, absolutely. And Yoel in a three rounder too can just come out and go for it a little bit. Took it, Tim Kennedy, Rashad Evans is on like one of the oh, first fights on the yeah. prelims. Yeah, but like, that's the sort of depth we're talking about wow. here with this card. It is just fucking phenomenal. Frankie Edgar, Jeremy Stevens. That is an insane, insane fucking card. That is set up three titles. Finish. Mm. Got the uh, t- the women's bantamweight. Yep. J- with jo- no, women's straw-weight. strawweight with uh, Joanna versus uh, Carolina. The the two, two Polish, Polish girls. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah like a bit yeah. of Polish Polish and, on Polish and that, crime. And that Carolina <laughs> looked outstanding in her last fight against that she Scottish, did, yeah. Scottish bird or whatever. She's a sort too. Yeah, she's a yeah. sort. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, they, there's out. nothing wrong with either of them no. at the uh, press conference. Yeah, they the, both the scrub sta- up. Yeah, well. A couple of stare downs, a couple of uh, sets of pins there on them. It was, uh, <laughs> definitely wasn't mad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fuck. And uh, and who else is on that card? T- Tyron Woodley defending his title against Stephen Wonderboy yeah, Thompson. That's oh, right. That's yeah. right. Just unbelievable. Like as good as they can make. It's a really bad stylistic fight for Wonderboy. No, not for Wonderboy. For um, for Tyron, mm. I think. Like Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, really long and rangy and hard to find. So you know, Robbie Lawler was the perfect mm. fight for uh, really Carlos. Was. Robbie was going to plant his feet and try and swing with yes. him. Where Wonderboy is. So tricky on the yeah. feet. Stephen Wonderboy yeah. Thompson for the casual fans is a decorated kickboxer who went some sort of 50, mm. 50 and yeah, zero yeah, fucking record yeah. over there. She has diverse kickboxing on the feet. And yeah, uh, if oh. you're a fan of that sort of flashy Conor McGregor style striking, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson's another one you're going to enjoy That's as well. It, mm. Con- Conor wishes he was Wonderboy, like <laughs> just diverse. Mm. That would be an amazing fight. Oh. Although, like, I I really thought that uh, Rory McDonald Stephen Wonderboy was going to be an amazing fight, but sometimes fighters fighters mm. styles cancel each other out. Yeah, yeah. but. But Rory isn't also a very aggressive style striker. It's true, counter- and he's also and they're both known, counter strikers. Yeah, yeah, and he's also not known for being a heavy puncher too. Mm. So you know, it, it's it, I always felt like that with that fight. Well, I remember we watched it in Bali, but I always always felt like that one was going to go all five, and it did. Mm. Your um, your Cheers, boy mate. BJ's got a fight. Yeah, man, fighting too. fighting um, Ricardo uh, Lamas. Yeah, Lamas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What, Look, what, what's BJ done wrong? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. Are they angry at BJ? They're well, like, here you go. You want to come back, BJ? Lamas is coming off a couple of losses, though, isn't he? Uh, ah, yeah, against some high level yeah. competition. And, though, and like good he, was, he was knocking on the door for yeah. a, for and a while there. It was him, him and Max Holloway in a in a in that. Like a moment of the year yeah, at, exactly. at the end of that fight. Lamas was well and truly still in that at yeah, that point. Yeah, you so. can't take anything yeah. away from him from I'm that uh, fight. I and think BJ is going to get his legs kicked to the shit in that fight. Yeah, and, and I know that, look, I know that I've always, I'm always making excuses for him and all that sort of stuff. I'm a forever, you know, BJ Penn supporter. There's no doubt about that. But I, I feel as though this one for me is a little bit different purely on the basis that he's back with... You know, with quality trainers at Greg Jackson's, he's back training with the Marinoviches. He's not just sort of sitting over on Hilo doing his own thing, training with his own training partners, all that sort of stuff. He's got Greg Jackson whipping him now. So BJ's what? I don't know. He's probably 35 or something like that. So obviously. 37. 37. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's pretty old. Sorry, BJ. No, 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 no. no I'm still with you, buddy. Yeah. Uh, I, I, honestly, I, I think that you, you'll see him come out. His boxing will be sharp. His takedown D is probably the best, if not, you know, like one of the best in MMA history. And, and his ground game is electric. Mm. So, you know, BJ can be a contender. He just needs to find his straps. That's true. He can. Uh, there's potential for B, BJ to catch him in something on the floor too. You did, right? So... You know, it's just one of those things. We'll see how it goes. But when is that fight before or after 205? It's before. See, there's so much stuff there. There's, there's good fights on the horizon for, for the fans out there. And in one press conference, 
it's a, overshadowed a, a future all of card it, yeah. just overshadows everything in there. Like we're talking, like Bisping Dan Henderson is coming up in Manchester. Yeah, like that I'm, I'm crazy. like I'm actually I'm really looking forward to that fight because after that first one where Dan Henderson threw a punch after Bisping that was knocked out that could have well and truly been a kill shot. <laughs> if we're, if we're talking about a a civilian in the street that's not conditioned to getting hit, he gets mm. talked that's about it. a lot. That oh, that follow oh. up. <laughs> he, he, Hendo's made that his logo. Yeah, like he's used that yeah. on all of his logo. Yeah. He's got that on his fucking boat. Everything like you name oh. it. He's that's one of the yeah. highlights of his. It's career. definitely something that I'm not a fan of seeing in uh, no in MMA. Yeah, I no. think I think what really like resonates with fans, even though it's a really violent game and stuff like that. Sportsmanship always is is a good. T- is a good take home from it. You see the Mark Hunt walk off knockouts and it's just like, that's a gentleman's way to do it. Like yeah. knock somebody the fuck out. And then give him a handshake. And then just walk off. They don't need any more punishment. Your yeah. work is done. See you later. I'm but a good sport. Shake the hand at the end of the fight. But that uh, Hendo was just like, Bisping's eyes were rolling back in his head. His legs were stiff. His oh. hands were down by his side. Hendo knew it and he said it in subsequent interviews and then just oh. follows up with the heaviest bomb, like Superman punch that you like. And it's just, oh, it's cringe. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot There's a lot of emotion there, man. I just wanted to shut his mouth a little bit. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, Dan, his like, head, come on. His head just bounces off the canvas like a basketball. Just oh, it's so <laughs> rough seeing that. Yeah. We, we might see Dan's head bouncing off the, head, oh, off the canvas man. this time definitely. too. Dan yeah. Henderson... For, like, is forty eight years old. Yeah, wouldn't wouldn't, like, wouldn't, think wouldn't have that. the same wouldn't have the same cardio, but still has that power. The and power is what you lose last. Yeah, exactly. And and I feel as though for that, you know, Bisping's going to be so on edge about it that that he's probably going to end up fucking wearing it again. But he definitely won't make the same same mistake he did as he did last time of just circling to that hand yeah. the entire uh, fight. He he would know? watch that fight back now because that's yeah. probably what seven years ago now. It's one of those things where he would look back and go, oh, what the fuck was I doing? As a lot more evolved mixed martial artist. Like yeah. Bisping is the best Bisping he's ever been at the moment, man. Oh, like he's, absolutely. He's really, man. really good. Absolutely. I'm, a hu- I'm a fan and I'm pulling for him to get it done. I hope he defends and gets his redemption, you know? Yeah, yeah. He's Plus for, the, for that division too, because if Dan wins, there's a really, really good chance that's his crowning moment and retires. So it just... That's insane to think we could have Dan Henderson as the new... Middleweight champion of the world. If, if we you saw wouldn't B- have called that six we, months ago. If we saw Bisping do it, Dan can do it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It, that's wild and Absolutely. that's what keeps you tuned I, I saw in. like a, um, uh, read an interview the other day with Dan Henderson where he talks about that he might not even retire. If it, it, he said if if it's if the money's right, he might even can continue yeah. to hang around. <laughs> I'll come, oh, like, yeah. Fucking come on, cunt. <laughs> like uh, you, you, you've already promised a bunch of times to, you know, to to retire it's time to go like this is with the best time to do it don't become like fucking tito ortiz yeah but then you can have the the opportunity where the carrots waved in front of you where you can come out and have one more and it's a 500 grand retirement top up good you know what i mean it's like all right well but then realistically he might get handed luke rockhold do you know do you know come out and dissect old (laughs) man dan no offense dan he's a legend but 46 i don't think dan wants none this is the safest fight dan can take at the moment i think and he doesn't he doesn't want the likes of chris weidman luke rockhold yoel romero at this point i'm gonna i'm gonna go a real real long range prediction i'm gonna go that that luke rockhold beats jacare and weidman beats yoel but like dan henderson fucking knocks out bisping again so they give Anderson Silva a, a rematch at Dan Henderson for the title, and and do Lot Rockhold and Weidman for the number one contender. Ooh, Ooh that r- oh, that's some long wow, range shit. But I like the way yeah, your mind works, yeah, man. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's on record now too, so we can look back, and you could be a fucking genius here. Yeah. In a, in a I couple tried couple to call on. something like that when um, it was after the Sydney card where we saw Rockhold beat Bisping. And, and I was at that point convinced that Anderson was going to come back and reclaim his title from Chris Weidman and then Rockhold was eventually going to be the one to take it from Anderson. But Anderson mm. never got back there. See, there's a guy that I'd Still write about Rockhold. Yeah. yeah. I, see, I, lo- I love stories like that. I'm forever willing Kelly Slater on to, to win another world title so that he can hang it up. I'd really love to see that happen. You know, Anderson versus Dan Henderson. Anderson to fucking take out Dan Henderson, win his strap back and then hang it up. 
you know, go mm. go out as the greatest of all time and, and all that sort of stuff. You just love seeing those oh, fairy tales. Yeah. You, you're just witnessing history type of exactly. thing. It's where you're like, oh, I saw that moment. That was fucking good. Like, and, and especially these days in the, the new model of the UFC where it's all about the commercialism and the selling of the fight as well as, you know, probably more so these days than people's earning of the fight you know going on big long win streaks i mean people still get title shots that way but but you also get title shots from just being in the right place at the right time you can sell the shit out of it yeah Yeah. i see that um dude posing as a journalist on um the 205 press conference tie guy tie guy oh the guy with the tie yeah 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 Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. i've got the fucking um video here man it's fucking hilarious (laughs) play it for anybody who hasn't seen it but this guy Jumps up and asks a question at the press conference because it's not a question at all. He's just throwing the ups and shit as well. How good is it, man? (laughs) Conor McGregor's like fan status is off the Richter, eh? Oh, yeah. 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 You don't see people acting like that at other people's presses. No, no, not at all. They're so behind him, it's yeah. not funny. They're not necessarily a UFC fan or a mixed martial arts fan. They're just a Conor McGregor fan. Yeah, and exactly. It, seem, it seems that there's a... It's not the country with the b- biggest population in its native land because there is fucking Irish everywhere. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. E- they're everywhere. They're like, yeah, well, you know, the population's like at 40 million or whatever it is, yeah. but there's fucking 50 million of them living abroad yeah. somewhere. Well, Amer- seems to be America's a relatively, like, young country. Australia's even younger, but, you know, so there is that sort of closer link to the, the old world, the heritage of where mm. do we come from sort of thing. So they all like, you know, I'm, I'm four-fifths Irish or, you know, I'm mm. Italian. Like Exactly. That th- Those are pretty much the two that seem to come from very little countries that you do find everywhere in the world. As in landmass size yeah 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 like, is it italy and and ireland yeah is, is six, a lot of six million is their population is italy's population is, uh, ireland ireland oh, ireland wow. six million Far out. that's like yeah, sydney, it's and, sydney and brisbane put yeah, together absolutely yeah. that's uh but there would have to be so many living abroad as well they've spread out everywhere i've been i've run into irish people eh? yeah. oh exactly yeah they're absolutely mm. everywhere mm. They're huge in the in the construction industry, believe yeah, it or not. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. A lot of a lot of them are concreters. Heaps yeah. and heaps and heaps of them are concreters. Yeah, you s- I used to live next to a, an Irish carpenter. Yeah, yeah. So apparently, it all happened when the, like there was a big downturn in the Irish construction industry or whatever, and they got visas to come out here and work. And yeah, and you know, obviously, concreting is one of those things that's just really easy to transition into. Concreter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some savages. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, lowest common den- denominator in some regards. Not all. <laughs> Not all. Shout it's out if you're a concrete. It's, <laughs> <fucking, laughs> it's fucking hard work. Oh, fuck. Not that I've ever actually done it. I did a, uh, a labor hire job once where I was guiding concrete trucks into a boom. Oh, yeah. That was about as close <laughs> as I came to being a concrete. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> Brutal. In, in, uh, living in Australia, it's some hard yakka. There's some long summers there. Yeah, oh, concreting. yeah, and, uh, yeah. All, I think all about tough those folks that do it. Oh, yeah, exactly. and, but I've met some uh, some people that I've known who are concreters have been fucking really, really good too. Like yeah, good value. They yeah. understand it like. Oh, a, I got some a, great concrete friends. A, mas- <laughs> a masculine sort of sense of humor through working through that industry and yeah. shit. Like and yeah. uh, funny. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think about those really like laborious trades like roofing and stuff like that, and think about the summer heat of Australia, and I just. I can't fathom how you how you could put up with it, but I guess it's like anything you condition to it. I've done my fair share of like late laborious sort of work, like landscape stuff and ge- general fucking furniture moving, just lifting heavy shit, digging holes, that sort of stuff. Mm. Like it's fucking hot, but it's like anything. You do it for a week and you and you sore as shit, and then uh, the next week you're not too bad, and then the week after you're basically just in the groove, and that's mm. it. That's your new thing now. What do you reckon's the hup- hardest labour top arrangement job you've done? Rendering. 
rendering solid plastering just like mixing up buckets of basically concrete um and then sort of carrying them up scaffold and oh, shit like yeah, that yeah um baby gap baby gap <laughs> 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 worked with really? baby gap man lots of little, <laughs> lots of lifting boxes and like, hanging to high areas like hanging the onesies up high overhead so like, lots of like <laughs> Debilitated shoulder injury and <laughs> shit. Like, uh, repe- yeah. Repetitive stress. Yeah, yeah that's right. right. Know, Absolutely. Yeah. Like, RSIs yeah. or whatever the fuck they call them. Tightest traps I've ever had. <laughs> 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 Thanksgiving 2013. Yeah, like, it was yeah. fucking brutal, mate. Meanwhile, oh. I'm still claiming comp. I <laughs> haven't been back there in two years. The hardest labour hire job that I've probably done. I did a summer in a warehouse, like picking car parts for orders for delivery and stuff one year, but... Uh, like the longest sort of days I did was working in a um, cold storage oh, place, driving yeah. pallet jacks around, oh, picking. Um, your brother used to do that. Yeah, yeah. He he was the one that lined it up for us. Um, brother worked in like the carcass room there, yeah. like loading all the full carcasses onto these trucks and shit like True. that. Sort of real heavy labour, like. But nineteen playing Colts football at the time he was like rugby union. 40, 50 kilo carcasses yeah. and stuff Picking like that. Picking them up, carrying them, and you end up working there with a couple of Polynesian boys that he's still mates with to this day. And perfect um, candidates and for it. No, it just ha- complete hard yakka. But I was just all I had to do was work work long hours, but was just picking up boxes of Mars bars to deliver to the Coles Warwick and shit <laughs> like that. Like, yeah. All confectionery. A, um, a buddy of mine, Mike, fucking <laughs> worked probably the worst job that I've ever heard of at uh, the Ingham Chicken Factory. And uh, they have these big open door barns where it's just all of the chickens in there. And, um, and any of the sort of lame or sickly looking ones, somebody needs to go through and, and break the chicken's neck on the edge of a bucket and uh, chuck it into a bucket and walk through and basically like kill that was kill the job. All. <laughs> that was the job. Oh. <laughs> walk through and pick up all the lame chickens and and like oh. execute them for your, for your so. 22 bucks an hour <laughs> like, yeah, oh for your 22 God. bucks an hour yeah. holy <laughs> shit out mikey that <laughs> yeah. is oh, oh it was horrendous hard yeah hard earned thirst needs a big cold <laughs> beer as soon as someone <laughs> <explained> <laughs> that to me I was sitting at the door. <laughs> oh, I'd have yeah. been like, oh, okay, is that the job? Oh, fuck, man, I'm not prepared to do that. So <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll I'd, catch yeah. later. Like, I'd, be, I'd, I'd rather be broke, yeah. mate. I'm sorry. I know, I like. drove here from Burndall, yeah. but... <laughs> yeah. I drank a lot when I had that job. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, it but, would be... But he said that yeah. they, were, um, they were, like, born on a conveyor belt, basically. Like, all, the, all of the eggs come out and they're hatched on a conveyor belt and then all of the, the, the ones Chicks. that don't make it to hatchlings go into, like, one bucket and then... Yeah, but he reckons that they're um, they're like they're, there's some weird behaviors in there. Like if they're all white, and if there's a brown one, the rest of the chickens kill it. Really? Yeah. Holy shit! Yeah. Wow. So they ne- so they're all white because if there is a brown one that makes it through, the rest of the chickens will peck it to death. Full racist oh, fucking yeah. chickens, yeah. man! Yeah. Holy yeah. shit! Jeez, strange. Crazy. Eh? Brown lives matter. Like, yeah, in the, yeah. In the chicken world, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like mm. insane, mm. crazy, ruthless stuff. I yeah, I saw something the other day that was saying a um, a chicken had the same intelligence as like another animal that I didn't think that um, like was I unintelligent at all. I was oh, I can't remember the animal that it was, but I was like, you know, holy shit! Like that shows how actually like probably intelligent chickens actually yeah. are or, or intuitive or whatever yeah. like they've definitely got you know like a cognitive process that's going exactly. on and they're making decisions and shit yeah. chicken says here chickens are smarter than human toddlers ah oh, well, they're more glued go. onto well, their, like, what's and, going and that's on. it I, I reckon any sort of like living creature that can that can feel emotions like whether that emotion is like being scared or, you know, or being excited or, or being, you know, whatever. But how on earth would we ever really quantify that? Like if you look at a cockroach or an ant or something, you could you could interpret it to be in distress and to be it suffering in some way, like it's on its back, it's flailing its limbs or, you know, it's it's moving around frantically because you, cause you hit it with a thong or whatever, yeah, you know? Yeah, uh, like junk mail that's lying a around f- the a house. A flip-flop to our, uh, our American yeah, listeners. Yeah. A flip flop. <laughs> you hit it with the thong. Yeah. You, 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 what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? You girls' panties, bro? <laughs> <laughs> On a roach? Yeah. Holy <laughs> shit, man! <laughs> How big is this roach? Oh fuck! What do you? Oh, I remember uh, I was at a baseball game in Seattle, um, for a couple couple of years ago, and we're drinking, like long road trip down, getting excited to go watching Seattle Mariners, New York Yankees. So we're like, yeah, let's get fucking. Boom. 
fired up for this few beers before we go in because they're all tailgating like outside the stadium and stuff like great atmosphere of like beer garden people playing beer pong was fucking sparking up conversations with everything we had people walking up to us hearing us talk and be like fucking hey like starting conversations with us like being be fully social when we're in the stadium fucking talking is that when you allegedly smoked a jeffrey uh that was the first trip we had there yeah yeah that was uh perfectly legal uh, oh yeah perfectly perfectly natural perfectly legal i'll, I'll go there after this like, <laughs> we're watching the game and he's got and um started getting a bit sourced up like few few beers in and um swearing a bit too much like we just like, sort of just in conversation as we do like we're just sort of firing away and this guy and his wife like turns around I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, who's that uh, you and who this is uh, me and uh brad from uh, <laughs> yeah, episode yeah, four yeah. Boss, yeah. boss's titties brad three. yeah yeah episode, <laughs> episode three yeah he was there and um i swear this guy, this guy sort of like turns around abruptly and we're like oh no here we go and he's like where are you from man i was like uh brisbane australia is home for me um He's like, man, oh, and I'm thinking he's going to chip us on the swearing. He's uh-huh. like, yo, man, you got to tell me about that funnel web spider, man. Like, str- <laughs> like straight up. And we started, I was like, oh, man, everywhere, bro. Like, we're, yeah, we're, just we're, playing it You up. go into your backyard, man, you'll find two or three holes, like, in, in your domestic backyard. They'll be, they call it the funnel web because they funnel down. And when you walk over it is when they'll come out and get you. <laughs> and uh, he's like, oh, man, I saw that on uh, like Nat, G- Nat Geo, man. Saw that on there. Like everyone around us starts talking in, like, in depth about this animal conversation. It was fucking, <laughs> <laughs> we thought we were getting in trouble. Ended up talking to these people about Australian animals for like 45 <laughs> minutes. So like, not really watching the ball game. Yeah. So, does it? How long does it go for? It just drags on for how long? Um, Three to four hours. Ooh, yeah, it's a, it's a long haul. It, yeah. it, it, it is a long haul. You have to commit to it. Like America's greatest pastime is what they yeah, call it. So if you're like, yeah. nothing to do, let's go down the ball game. It's not overly expensive regular season because they play. Okay. As in the beers and stuff like that, aren't uh, The tickets. Right. Tickets. right. Alcohol and stuff inside is expensive. That's like, as you Yeah, you yeah. want to be drinking the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah most definitely. Yeah. And uh, the, yeah, the tickets itself weren't expensive because they play... 154 games a year and shit mm. in baseball. Is that right? Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they'll play three or four times a week. Shit! Yeah. How yeah. do the fucking pi- hell do they hold up to that? Uh, they have a rotation. Like the squads are big, oh. so you'll you'll pitch one day. Starting pitcher will come up. Like say you're their gun, like number one starter. You'll start sort of game one of that week or the most important game. Then you'll rest up for four days, yeah. five days, and you won't okay. pitch again. So gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, a lot That's of strategy great. to it. So tell us about this uh, podcast that you've been listening to that you've been hiding from us, <laughs> saving it, saving it for another episode. You're listening to this potty, like yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, I was, I was uh, episode that I heard of this one the um the other week, which was which was really good. We was talking What's about the podcast. Oh, the Radio Lab, man. Radio Lab, yeah. Radio. I've heard I've heard of that before. Yeah, Radio Lab, and um, th- who is the host of that? Or is it's, not it's one particular like, host? It's like these these. Can, like a group of people that sort of get together and, and do it's not like a typical pop podcast where like they have although they do have conversation with each other they they tell a narrative through interviewing right. interviewing different people and and taking sound grabs of different people's conversation and then editing that into and being like preluding it with and then such and such said and and telling a bit of the story and then being like and then this person Boom! That person kicks in, and, and you hear it like from that. Is it sound in? Grab is it in them. the podcast app, or is it a radio thing? Yeah, it's a pod. It's a podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 it's, it's, it's yeah. epic, man. It'll download any of them. They're all they're all fucking ridiculously good. But this one that I was listening to um, the other day was talking about this um, this guy over in the states who um like a, a guy called like McNutt or something like that that's it, like really his oh, name McNutt. His, yeah. his name <laughs> is he, McNutt he McNutted in his pants yeah and <laughs> and as as most shit does like um started with the military in in Afghanistan or Iraq and all that sort of stuff is that they were losing heaps and heaps of US soldiers to roadside bombs and so what, what they wanted to effectively do was to try and find out where the, the roadside bombs were going off and then be able to, to sort of like backtrack from who placed it there and all that sort of stuff. 
So this guy McNutt invented this this little miniature plane that would fly at thirty thousand feet above, like at a, a full city, like the all of Iraq, all of Afghanistan, all that sort of stuff, and take a photograph every single second, like a high resolution photograph that would just take a photo, chink, 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 and just like for twenty four hours a day, just take photos over the city. And, um, and then they'd find where these roadside bombs would go off and then they'd backtrack it. And then so what, this guy took that, that idea and made it a privatised privatized thing and did trials with it in, um, in like Suarez in, um, in Mexico where they have like a, a, a huge homicide rate with the police force and all that sort of stuff. And, and they were able to... The drug to, cartels. The drug cartels. And they were able to like show footage of like this person who, this cop, pulls up at this light and this other cop and then this other car pulls up next to him like just executes this this female police officer and then they follow like this pol- this this gang car like back to this headquarters and then they find out by f- following a whole bunch of other through still photography yeah through stills so they're able to like follow it frame by frame back to where it is and zoom in on areas so they, they know that if this person was executed at this location, they can then zoom to that area and then follow the people that were were with it in real time and back to locations and stuff. So they tried to, to float it in the States and they and they trialled it in, in like Baltimore and, and all this sort of stuff and it had really good traction with the, the crimes that it was solving. But the huge issue that they have with it was that no one would buy into it like into using it for anything other than monitoring traffic because people are so concerned with their privacy that no one's willing to to actually vote this shit in so it just opens up the the i guess the moral question of do you value your security over your privacy you know which is more important to you sort of thing my privacy do some old-fashioned fucking police work you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that, that's sort of, that's sort of how I feel about it. I reckon. So you where you wouldn't you wouldn't vote it in I, if I don't that like technology the, was available in Brisbane. I don't like the concept of Big Brother. Like it's I just do. yeah, it's just yeah. sort of one big photographic tracking device sort of thing. I well, that's sort why of, people won't won't yeah. issue it, issue it to have but it. But hey, in. look, I'm, in saying that, I'm walking around with a fucking iPhone in my pocket. Like for sure, mm. that would be yeah. You th- and that's that's the way that I always sort of think about it. Is like you know when you you selecting like, do you want this app to to use your location services and you, and you click, oh, like, nah, nah, I don't want that. Like, if, if that's available to them to do it, they obviously have the ability to do it. Like, if you were doing some surreptitious shit and, uh, and they wanted to track your phone, if that's a matter of pressing yes or no, I'm sure they can override that command and do whatever the fuck they want anyway. But I, I'm with you. Like, I don't, I don't reckon, um, you know, that we should have 24-hour surveillance on everybody and you know everybody's movements tracked and i i know you can make the argument that if you're not doing you know untoward shit then um then you have nothing to worry about but i don't know i just think in uh in the wrong set of hands you know we've seen throughout time that democracy is like you know one way of governing a society we've seen countless dictatorships and there's still dictatorships that exist in in 2016 you look at north korea and stuff like that and it's sort of once you let uh a governing body have too much power over yeah. the people i think you you lose all of that you know individual rights and it's sort of this this mob of people who are no different biologically to you and me but they're the ones sitting at the at the button and they're the yeah. ones that get to make all the choices and nobody's watching their shit and i think yeah. that's like when you get all these edward snowdens and shit like that that come out and expose people it's sort of if if we as a fucking society or we as a people have to be open to the idea of you know, it, we have no privacy, everything's open, open slather, then show us what the fuck's in, in Hillary Clinton's, you know, inbox or show us what's in fucking Barack Obama, what's in all that sec- those secret files and shit like that. Like, And they, and they reckon that, oh, I heard a stat the other day that they say that, all, that 10% of the stuff that is actually classified needs to be classified. Because literally most of for the military stuff that, strategy and stuff like well, that. Mo- yeah. Most of the stuff that's classified is just about you know government meetings that that have happened or and and you know they need to transfer funds to something else that is mostly just stuff that they can classify because they 
you know, it's easier if they can put it under that umbrella so it doesn't get out into the mainstream media, but it doesn't really need to be because it's not sort of anything that the public couldn't digest. It's just the stuff that the government couldn't be fucked you finding out about. Mm. You, you know? could get into any classified <coughs> folder. Roswell. It, you'd go to Roswell straight Go straight up. to the yeah. aliens, man. Show me the extraterrestrial yeah, file, 100%. Give Absolutely. a fuck about whether yeah. you got fucking Obama, yeah. oh, not Obama. Oil and all that Osa- yeah. Osama, whether that was true or not. Yeah, you cut me in on that. Maybe maybe the moon landing, I don't know, but I, I want to hear about them aliens. Oh, the m- yeah, moon landing, same. yeah, you'd brush that aside. You know? <laughs> no, like, oh, look, I don't really care. We're, I'd take, we know I'd take the moon can... landing over um, Osama, though. Imagine if you I'd, had... 9-11 like, would intrigue the shit out of me. Imagine if you but had... But I'd go the aliens, and if they're like, no. Something else like what to see if it was actually um, Al Qaeda? Yeah, just to see what sort of notes that they or had in terms in, of the in, conspiracy theories around nine eleven to see if to, any of that shit's yeah, true. Just to be able to read that file cover to cover and just debug everyone that, that everything that sort of all the mm. skepticism and things like that. Yeah. Like, see if it's like, oh, hey, he, Mister X was actually responsible for this. Like, Do you reckon yeah. the the president gets access to absolutely everything, or there nah. would be stuff that's classified from? people in their presidency it would be open slather bro he's running so. the shit man i don't yeah, think so yeah but but yeah i don't think i think I don't they would think have military would strategists yeah. and shit like that that yeah. would be like you know it's it's in everyone's best interest i don't know because you, you got to think I've about these people come from different political parties mm. they come with different vested interests exactly. they get voted in by a group majority i think i think they rubber stamp everything uh, I don't know. I think they're probably a lot more of just a fucking visual figurehead than you actually think. And, yeah. you know, oh, that's oh, why Obama, you know, came into office with all of this sort of hope and, and, and change and hype behind him. And yeah, but you got to get it through Congress. Exactly. Exactly. And so, like, you know, you, you're stunted sort of from the system. They don't have ultimate power, I don't think. And, yeah, I mean, the same same can be said of Australian politics. We get we get different governments in, but nothing seems to really fucking it's, change. It's, it's weird these, uh, the U.S. Po- like politics system though that s- it, in certain times that you have to take certain things to Congress if they're new and all that sort of stuff. But one of the crazy things that I, I think that they don't actually have to take to Congress at the moment because they're in a like in a wartime sort of thing situation is that they don't actually have to to have a, a group vote on whether you unleash a nuclear wef- weapon. like that, that is just ultimately the decision of the acting president at the time. So that, that, that's one of the things that they're saying about Trump and stuff at the moment is because in previous non-war times, there's a structure in place based around sort of the, the Congress and all that sort of stuff that in order to get absolute power to be able to unleash nuclear weapons you have to take it to congress and 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 tell them this is the reason why we we wanted need to execute this and they'll give you a vote on whether you can or you can't except at the moment because i think it was bush has already had that 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 permission granted like to be able to you know pull the trigger on it because of the times that we're in 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 sort of an instant so that 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 standing agreement still stands for when um when Trump comes in if he comes in. That seems in. like a fucking a it pretty crazy it, policy, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I don't, doesn't it? But it, I, I don't know. It, it's I'd have to look. I'm calling look. fact check on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I only I, I I only heard it the other day um on uh Joe Rogan's podcast with Dan Carlin, yeah. like who's a the historian. fucking president of uh the U.S. has the ability to to press a fucking warhead into a country, yet the Australian Prime Minister can't get gay marriage fucking <laughs> signed off. Mm. <laughs> what are you waiting for you goose like, yeah i think it's 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 it. it's more of a um it's more to the argument of you know these these leaders they get in they get into power with all of this hype behind them and everybody thinks that they're going to make a difference and malcolm turnbull stood for all of these sort of further left-wing I- ideals and um ideologies and he's obviously the member of a right-wing party, but has gotten in and has become so stifled by that party that all of the things that people thought that he stood for and, and a lot of the reason why people voted for him, um, he hasn't been able to get through. And, I mean, personally, I've just, you know, I've, I've lost interest in it. Like, it seems like we've been talking about a plebiscite in the media for fucking how many months and it's just it's just fatigue. Like, people just get fatigued by it and it, it it's just... Dis- disheartening i think as a young person in australia when you know you you 
you're basically stuck with this system of oppositional politics where you don't feel like anybody represents you. You don't feel like anybody's doing something with your best interests at heart. It just seems like everyone is just giving the opposite argument to what the other bloke says. And it's just, you just, that's why they think, you know, like why they question why young people aren't enrolled to vote. It's like, cause nobody gives a fuck. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to us because nobody's making sense. It's mm-hmm. like, give us somebody. And, and I think that's sort of why Trump has gotten to where he is because he's, he's made these waves and he's spoken a bit more of a, like a realist and stuff like that. So he gets people behind him, but ultimately he doesn't have the political experience, but it'd just be nice to be able to see, you know, somebody get into, into, the prime ministership and actually do what they said they were going to do. If you were going in, uh, like I'm, I'm pulling for him over Hillary. I can't believe. Yeah, that's I'm that's where I was going. If you that. if you if you walk into that polling booth as a like I'm somewhat no, I, I understand in like in my state who the premier is. I understand mm. who the prime minister is and things like that. But I don't get any level of depth. But imagine if you're in my position over there, walking into the polling booth. Just seeing them sort of talking and things like that, not really understanding the policy too much or with that much depth. But who do you walk in and press? But like they have to go and press a button on their election. That's who you are. Like you go and sign in or whatever. Boom, click a button. Who are you pressing? Yeah, I'd I'd you press Trump, man. I I can't believe I'm going to say that, but I, I don't really understand it. Same as yourself, but I would definitely vote Trump. For what reason? Oh, just simply just for, for the circus for, of it. For the, no, for the reason that you just said before, in terms of. We've been governed for so long by, you know, really uh, one type of model of leader. Whereas, you know, then then you bring in somebody who's effectively going to turn it on its head in in that that he doesn't bring in that sort of that historical sort of perfection that sort of comes with old politics and shit like that, dynasties and... Yeah, I think for me... Having watched, um, I guess, probably the majority of that uh, first 2016 debate they did during the week. Um, Because up until that point, I'd sort of, I hadn't seen so much of their speeches in in regards to what they stand for. I'd just seen sound bites and media and other people's opinions on it. Um, So I wasn't really sure where I stood. But after that debate, I can can clearly say that I'd, I'd choose Hillary just for the fact that I felt like in that debate, I can see sort of why Trump's been able to gain so much popularity in that he's latching onto these ideas that, that people really sort of um, resonate with and in terms of, you know, Americans having lost a lot of their business to overseas um, places that, that charge them lower taxes and that sort of stuff and money going out of the country and he uses China as like a as as a buzz topic because you know um, Americans all have this complex that China is going to become the the world power even though they arguably already are (laughs) and um, and and most of what he's saying is basically stating some of the problems that exist and Mm. not really a whole lot of uh sort of argument in his in his debate about what do we do to fix it? And, yeah. and I think Hillary had a, had a better sort of, um, you know, she she was better at explaining her policies and what they would do and all that sort of stuff. And you and you sort of, for me anyway, I, I watched that and I realized, okay, we've clearly got you know the difference here between somebody who understands politics and somebody who's been really good at working the media and working the sort of um, l- like the low, lowest common denominator denominator sort of thing like the the people who don't necessarily understand anything about politics but they just want to hear somebody say some outrageous shit and sort of break the norm and then it gets them on board so i don't know i think uh i think hillary hillary wins it for mine but it's it's a crazy social thing that fucking trump's been able to get as far as he's gotten for sure like i i I see what you're saying chris where if he became president it would be that shake up from sort of the status quo like it would be different under him, but I can't help help but think we got Bill just in Hillary's ear, ear just using her as a puppet sort of thing. Like yeah. I'd, I'd give Clinton a go as well. I'd, I'd yeah. have to vote Hillary. Just stick with the status quo of it all. As you, you yeah. made a really good point there, where it's it almost seems like we've got a politician versus a really really good billionaire salesman. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know yeah. What I mean, was, but she sort of crushed a few points in that debate where Donald didn't really have too much of a rebuttal. Yeah. And, and I think, though, that, that, that there'd be an element of having a, a really good businessman like Trump 
running a country that really needed to almost be run like a business though for a while because there's a lot of debt in the world and, and there's a lot of sort of problems that, that I guess problem problems that I guess Barack hasn't really come up with a solution to. Trump would be the richest guaranteed president in United States history by a long way, man. Like I think like Abraham Lincoln or something like that might be on that list at like 500 million or something, but... Mm. Um, but I think yeah, pe- people worry that yeah. Holy fuck. Fact check that shit. But it's one of them. Abe it's it's Lincoln, Abe Lincoln or um or who's the other one who wrote the um it was Bill real George Washington. George Washington, one of those two man was worth five hundred fucking million. Yeah, well, people will will argue and like obviously Hi- Hillary will too that um that uh, his his um his wealth was acquired like I think he you know he inherited like. 14 million or billion dollars or something like that as like a small child and uh and his whole life and concept of money has been at at the wealthy elite you know so yeah he's he's talking about lower taxes for massive big business and that's probably a huge part of what the problem that america already suffer from in that they've got these massive corporations like uh, you know, fucking making heaps and heaps of money, and then the disparity between them and the and the lowest lowest people, like in fucking Chicago and shit, they've got some crazy fucking slums and stuff like Short that. Rack. Man, they've got like full on poverty in the U.S. and it's and it's not in any way a third world country. No, that's a crazy fucking thing. Jo- George Washington. It yeah, was. I was going to say because I've looked I've looked up Abraham Lincoln. I've done a bit of a fact check there. He was worth. Uh, less than a million bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's actually one of the poorest. Yeah, yeah, George Washington's the guy that I was trying to think Wowee. of. Five hundred and twenty-five million. Man, you can imagine that money George filtering Washington. down through his family as well. Yeah. Like that'd still be bawling out of that cash. Yeah. His descendants. I want to help you, George Washington. <laughs> George. Even your dreams are square. Bill, Bill Clinton with fifty-five. Mills. He's 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 up there. So Hillary's got access to that. George W. George W. with twenty-three million yeah still got nothing barack on, Oba- on barack obama with seven yeah, and you're looking at these guys now talking trump who's a billionaire yeah exactly so exactly let who's him, like let him have four it, billion you know i think um malcolm turnbull's one of our wealthiest prime ministers yeah, absolutely yeah. he is he's worth i'll tell you who, who's got a lot of fucking dough too is hockey that um joe, joe hockey, hockey really whatever is he cashed I think he's fucking loaded, man. I'll wow. have to do his Clive net, his Palmer. net worth on Google. Oh, man, there's some rich rich men out there, right? Gina Reinhart. Yeah. Oh. oh, Joe. Yes, Joe Hockey net worth. Um, 5.4 million. Is he really? Is that all? Yeah, is that all? <laughs> 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 Ugh, man. Like, wouldn't even talk to him, really. Uh, like. That's so funny. <laughs> The, you oh no, no! The, his main his house is worth five point four million. Oh so right, 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 right. Yeah, you know, some little humble abode somewhere. You know, a little. <laughs> Can you Joe. imagine having a gaff that was fucking worth five million? It would just be. You see that one fucking I, Pat Rafter sold recently for eighteen million. The thing that's the no. thi- that's the thing, man. I, in Sydney, where hockey would be living, it's pretty easy to spend five million well, that's on a true. property. Yeah, and I was talking to yeah. an architect over the weekend who was doing. Um, bit of planning work for a client that was looking to set up sort of a unit and he was looking to like, sort of ball their place out a little bit. So this couple went down th- with the intention of spending sort of one point something, you know what I mean? Like, mm. w- like well, if we get it to like one seven or one eight, we really have to start asking some really hard questions of ourselves. Mm. And this was a three-bedroom unit in Randwick. It was just, just a unit, three-bed, one bath. And... They fly all the way to Sydney, book accommodation for the weekend, everything like right over. We've got everything lined up. We can make a hard go at this. S- cap out at one eight. First bid two point one. <laughs> it's a oh. complete waste of time. End up going for like two point <laughs> four and a half. Wow. For a three bedroom, one bathroom unit in right. Sydney. Wow. Far out. Yeah. I went to my first property auction the other week. Right. Oh, it's an interesting experience. Yeah, eh? yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been to a few different auctions, but um. For like cars and things like that, I've been to the, the city motor auctions yeah. down there on uh, no, Kingsford Smith Drive. Yeah, I've been to that one yeah, too. Yeah, been to that watch, one watching a few cars. Times. Like it's yeah. a, it's a crazy thing to um to just go and observe with oh, no yeah. with no sort of intent to to buy, but just to witness because you've got 
you know, the intense energy of the people that are actually bidding and then these basically just shysters like, what do you got? What do you got? Yeah, fucking G yeah, and them up yeah, and it's like, yeah. oh shit. 10,000 here on one. Yeah. Like, yeah, fucking, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. all of a sudden you've, anyway. yeah, you've paid 150 more than you you had planned to yeah. and your wife's just shooting your deaths. So like, yeah. what have you done? Like, <laughs> Man, I remember a, uh, <laughs> our buddy Kyle who like, he was on the, came on the podcast, he had a uh, story from where he was on the piss one night at a, uh, at a charity auction at a boxing event so he'd gone, got incredibly sourced at this uh, event and there's a big signed guitar from uh, Slash comes up in a frame with like a photo of Slash and this guitar. They had the guitar or just a photo <laughs> of him with the guitar? I think it might be the guitar. As a, like a raffle f- prize? Just a, like not one of his originals or anything or something that he just might have a signed. a shitty guitar yeah. that yeah. he signed. I'd, I'd okay. have to ask Cole, but yeah, there's okay. a, a big sort of picture frame. Like I thought a real you were saying like, a, no, like no, one yeah. the Les Paul he played yeah. at Wembley yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Like, no, no, no. like a giveaway. Yeah, Cole made a run at it. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the sort of thing that you probably would oh, have no. run at. Because oh, oh, if no. you only had 100 if people born. in a room. If you're oh. born. But if you only had 100 people in a room, man. It's a big picture frame. It's a big... Might be a signed photo of him in this thing anyway, or like a detailed sort of like slash piece. And he's got gets in this um, bidding war with a bloke there, and um, ends up fucking winning it. Like sort of going in half jokingly, ends up winning this thing for, I think close to two and a half grand. Oh. And uh, calls his mum like right away, going, "Oi, I need you to log into my uh, oh, you joking? In, into my account. I've just I've just fucked up and won this auction, and there are." Uh, couple of heavies sort of here like yeah yeah here we go come up the front mate like we'll fucking write you up like it's all going to charity or whatever oh. yeah. he's like yeah right i'll just uh, i'll just wire some money mate I'll, I'll, I'll love it like i'll, I'll be right there so <laughs> 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 no good no. Uh, brutal. no good at all just absolutely just gun it from your table like for the exit just yeah, clearing yeah, people yeah, trolling like them a there like, oh, no. <laughs> at a boxing event too like oh yeah. no. we're just gonna yeah. let the uh, middleweight and the co-main warm up on you out the back like exactly. oh, be such a like um like buying weird weird items and shit like that at at auctions and stuff i i I love watching that uh antiques road show man that's like such a a good show to take a nap to but there's something about it that i just find so comforting Mm. but like i remember watching it one time and there was this um there was this guy who had brought in what looked like basically a big pot but it was one solid piece, like a, a big heavy stone. And uh, I think he had just moved into a house where it was out the back and basically he'd used it as a pot plant and um, and then decided to bring it into the show. And they actually dated this thing back to the Middle Ages and it was mm. like a, um, a a pot that they would have used, uh, like a, a bowl, I guess, that they would have used to grind spices and stuff like that sure. and um was worth a fucking mint man it was like worth millions of dollars this just big Ooh. rock just because it was so so old and i remember watching it and just thinking imagine being at that end of wealth where you were just you know for for shits and gigs on a, on a mm. wednesday morning you were going to this auction in new hampshire and uh because they've got some potentially got some good medieval items there i want to get i want to pick up a few medieval items from you know the early Early, whatever, like sixteen. Yeah, they got they, they yeah. got an axe from the Crusades. There, I've got my eye on. When were the cru- yeah. when were the Crusades have been? Fourteen hundred. Fourteen hundred. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's just off the top of my head. But yeah. uh, it bring it was came to the front of my. Yeah, because I guess I guess we started to get real colonial and people wearing those wigs and weird sort of um, Victorian era, like in the sixteen hundreds, yeah. and then yeah. and then gradually through the seventeen and eighteens was sort of like the centuries of exploration, and that's you know like we're talking about earlier, Australia was founded in what seventeen seventy seven, so I think when um, Cook first first arrived, something like that. It's, it's crazy when you go somewhere like Europe and and you're looking yeah. at buildings that are fucking 600 years old and you're like wow my country's not even half that old exactly They're, like this building would have been here before there was anything before there was Cronulla mm. before there was Bondi Beach before there was absolutely anything it's crazy. Crusades uh, 1095 to 1291 there you go that's <sighs> early days that's a long time too that's early know, days man, man. that's, that's a long so time if we were talking about you know Ned Kelly back in the in the 18th century and how rudimentary that was riding a horse from you know little shanty to little shanty no such thing as electricity just you know mm. kerosene lamps or whatever if they even had that and no. Fuck no, no, it'd just be torches there. Torch like flames, yeah, there. laying yeah. in a camp. Just jo- dolphin fucking torches yeah. only. Yeah. 
Sleep, <laughs> sleep in an animal. <laughs> yeah. Big dual battery. <laughs> Only batteries. But imagine going back then a further like six or seven hundred years from there, going oh, back to yeah. the, the dark ages and shit. Fuck I guess that's why it. they call it the dark ages because yeah. fire was a rare thing. Yeah. Just raping and pillaging just town to town. Yeah. Like just <laughs> no Only being yeah. able to exist during the day. Sort Sleeping of in, the barely win- in the winters in animal skins. Yeah. And un- only recently civilised, really. Like mm. a, a lot of like early... Well, I guess I guess we would have been civilized since you know BC days or whatever. Around that era, classified like as. The, the average life expectancy of people was like thirty five years. Yeah. So if within you, within that sort of within that 200, 250 year lifespan, we've gone from a period of of a life expectancy of thirty five to like eighty mid eighties. Yeah, you know, that's so wild. Like, I mean that that's a long, long ex- like life expectancy gap. And one would argue that. Um, human beings were never really intended to live that long. You know, when you look at the, mm. the procreation system of human beings and how women get to a certain age where they can no longer generate eggs and men get to a certain point where they like become more sterile or, or less, I don't know what the word is, but... Tully. <laughs> yeah, sex drive, yeah. like erectile function and yeah. all that sort of shit dissipates. You're basically meant to be alive about 35 years you know that by that time you've gone through your 20s you've propagated at least 10 kids or something like that you've served your purpose you you go to rest but it's only through now technology and medical science and all Mm. this sort of shit that they reckon potentially in 2016 the first 150 year old person has been born like the person Mm. that's going to live to 150 has been born that's the thing would that's like giant fucking tortoise spec hugely (laughs) yeah you'd see a lot of shit in that time imagine sort of back then though 35-year-old man in the Crusades doesn't look like a 35-year-old man in 2016. No, he's by weathered any as a motherfucker. Oh, he had my leg chopped off in yeah. uh, that battle. I lost my oh. fucking elbow in that one. Um, I, did you I'm see that movie, uh, The Revenant? Is it yeah, The Revenant? With, with uh, Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio won the Academy Award for it. Oh, yeah. But it's yeah. it's back in like the fur trapper days when there were still Native Americans and, um, and early American settlers like going to war in these fucking remote parts of Montana and all, all sort of mm. mil- middle American forests and shit like that. And these are all potentially young men or, you know, not even not even 30-year-old men and they're all just like battered to the no. nines. And mm. the guy that this is about, is, his name escapes me, it's based on a true story, but he gets absolutely fucking mauled by a bear and survives. And, uh, and you think about that sort of stuff. If you're out living in the elements mm. in the fucking ice and, and wilderness and stuff like that, you would have been burnt and scratched and, and, and had so many bones broken and, and reset fucking inaccurately and shit so like yeah, that, yeah, like twisted natural. limbs and fucking all kinds of shit. A splint on your leg for eight weeks while you're still hiking, and like that's what they say. Like, man, he looks weathered. That guy, like, he's yeah. back then sleeping out in the elements every night. Exactly. We're getting that. Yeah, we're getting that go. nice eight hours with that roof over our head each night. It's funny how there's <laughs> there's functions of speech like that that you don't even really think about. Like, what's the actual meaning behind that? Like saying that somebody looks weathered, and you actually, when you think about that in a literal literal term, it probably made more sense. You know, a few hundred years ago, Definitely. when it's like, oh yeah, he looks a bit weathered. He looks like he's been out in the weather hasn't had yeah. a whole lot of shelter like yeah. he's only 35 and he looks like he's one foot in the grave yeah, yeah he's trekked well, there 35 for would have been the, <laughs> the end of the rope oh fuck mm. yeah you know you, you would have definitely been thinking oh geez, like, how did you passes. make it this yeah, long man it's yeah, it's yeah. savagery out here yeah, come exactly. in for an ale you old warrior like, yeah like, um, exactly shit like that <laughs> Drinking all sorts of homebrewed alcohol oh, and shit back then. Oh, just yeah. rocket fuel mu- moonshine yeah. spec shit. You I'm know, just thinking if about you could, if you could go back to one one year for like, let's say, uh, ninety minutes, uh, the length of one of these podcasts with immunity round, and shit, round, roundabouts. With, yeah, with yeah. God mode on, yeah, so you right, could go, yeah. you could go back and and you oh, and you definitely come back to two, two, 2016 or all G. It's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum. Yeah. And I'm all out of gum. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Shake it, baby. Like go to the, <laughs> go to the strip club. Go, to, go back to the, like 87 and go to one of the strip yeah. clubs. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Bring me your higher <laughs> love. <laughs> I love it. Duke Nukem. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jer- Jerry <laughs> Kill <Kelly> and <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> if you could... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, if I could, I uh, <laughs> I don't know where I'd uh, at what point it'd be some sort of like 
super combative era type of thing. It'd have, have to, to be a long, long yeah, time ago. Definitely. I reckon you'd want to go to early. But but do you think there'd be less back then? I don't know. I guess it would it be... Would. I'd want to be thrown into a spot be, where there was interaction. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. You'd want to be like at the at the crucifixion or something yeah. like that. Right. Yeah, that'd be heavy duty. Happened. I'd be at the 1978 grand final. Like, fucking go back. <laughs> 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 like, man, you would waste it like yeah. that. Like, man. Winfield <laughs> Cup, 1978. You might that's think it's a waste, mate. Like, <laughs> you, oh, there man, would like, be people that would yeah, choose that, definitely man. There would be cheap people. That, that was the best day of my that. life. I want to go back there. Yeah. Like, I want to watch yeah. it again. So that's that the, that's the day that I fucked Sally such yeah, and such yeah. under the... I want to play it back. Yeah, under the leases. i got 90 minutes. I know exactly the time I want to go back to. Got their first load swallowed. Yeah. <laughs> <They're just fucking laughs> looking to relive it over and over again. You're just like, oh, look at me. Look at the look on my face. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, like it was yesterday. Uh, <laughs> Marty McFly. Uh, just yeah. yeah. Precisely, yeah. man. How crazy would a Groundhog Day situation be, though, where you just had to relive the same day over Groundhog and over Day. Again, yeah. Without consequence of, of really... It would just reset every single day. Mm, it would be difficult. You get up to, some to maintain mischief. your sanity. It would be tricky. Yeah. The time. Um, yeah, it just suck because you wouldn't have enough time to really get anywhere. Because it'd only be where you could get to in a day, and then you'd be back straight same in the exact same spot. Yeah. Do you know this uh, interesting thing I heard of the other day too? What back to what we were talking about about real rich motherfuckers is there's this thing getting around at the moment or, or has been getting around for a while, like a number of years anyway, but it's called like the Giving Pledge, which was started by, um, which was started by, uh, who's the, Bill Gates. Sounds yeah. like a pyramid scheme yeah. coming here, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Started, started yeah. by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, who are the other world's number one and number two richest people. And it was just a pledge that they all buy into that, says that before either like during your life or when you or when you die that all of all of your money nearly goes to pretty much all of your money goes to charity like 99 percent of it and um bill gates has signed up and he's got a net worth of 70 billion warren buffett has got a net worth of 65 billion into this like all all the mark zuckerberg's in it like ray dalio's in it like all these ridiculous um you know billionaires from out the world are in it and they've got this this pledge at the moment going which is it to the tune of something like 600 billion or something like that that's going to go to charity in these people's lifetime that are all alive today so you're thinking about like when was this created I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll look it up and I'll tell Seems you. Seems like it could solve a whole lot Fuck of Fuck yeah. It could solve a lot of problems yeah. with $600 billion. Well, that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying is that, that Bill Gates, that, you know, there's Mother Teresa's and all this sort of stuff that have done their bit for, for the world, but they're saying that what Bill Gates will have done by doing the giving pledge and and also contributing his $70 billion, mm. you know, like once he's done, sort of almost... I guess little, arguably uh, little Susie Zuckerberg's gonna be pissed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> no, but but <laughs> she would be fucking. Yeah, it, they, they'd yeah. set everybody up in their life that well, they needed to. It's it's you can't spend that much money. No, yeah, no, I think no. I think part of the pledge is that you you got it. You give ninety nine percent. So the in in um, Warren Buffett's case, he he's like the world's most successful share investor, and he's worth six, 65 billion, and um and he's giving like one percent to his family which is 650 million <laughs> yeah. you know like i mean 1%. so it, it's like he the n- other 99 percent of his net worth it, it, of all his worth is going to charity he's giving 650 million to his family these are these which is one percent of his net worth yeah and the millionaire the billionaires would want to put their name forward for that like that is legacy there oh, in a nutshell I'll, I'll right the, i'll read yeah. you the list yeah you know you've, you've you've struck the fucking lottery you you made it you made it to the absolute end of what a human being is possible to do in 2016 in the society in the in the financial market and you've you got that fucking a plus like and uh you know what do you do then what what sort of legacy do you leave as a human being if you've got you know the historical figures we talked about marcus aurelius last week aristotle like these are famous historical figures and with something like this it's like you know you've got a chance to carve your mark in history remember when these group of billionaires came up with this thing that that solved all of the problems of east africa or yeah yeah i'll, I'll read you a few so, so bi- first of all i heard bi- of it bi- bill and melinda gates have pledged 77 million 
What Warren Buffett, sixty six million. Wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. You said fucking ninety nine percent of his net worth before. You said he was worth billions, and now he's only given sixty five mil. Did I say million? Yeah. We're talking billion. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Really? So like, what my did bad, he, what my did, bad. did you say he's, Bill and Hillary were yeah, first? Bill and Melinda Gates, seventy seven billion. I I, I giving seventy seven billion, billion 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 with a billion B. Hillary. What <laughs> War, Warren Buffett, sixty six billion. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, thirty five billion. Um, who else is on here? Elon Musk, thirteen billion. Branson. Um, yeah, Richard Branson. Where's he on here? Yeah, he's on. Uh, Where you at, Richie? In. Yeah, there's so many people on here that you'd you'd have never heard of though that are rich as fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <but> straight, <laughs> straight balling. Yeah, exactly. But um, so total total like value of the the pledge is. Did we work out when this came about? Three hundred and sixty-five billion. I'll tell you. Um, in June of two thousand and ten, the gl- the Giving Pledge campaign was formally announced. Two thousand and ten. Yeah, was Same formally year announced. As Occupy. And Bill Gates and Warren Buffett began rec- recruiting members. In two thousand eleven, Gates and w- Buffett met with wealthy individuals in India and China and invited them to join the campaign. The aggregate wealth of the first forty pledges was one hundred twenty-five billion as of August in two thousand and ten. That's awesome, man! I hope it goes through. Yeah, it'd be interesting once they see when the uh, when they do pass push comes on, to shove. Yeah. yeah, what sort of legality that they have in place for it's like, all right, we'll cough it up. And who, which which charities get what yeah, and all that sort of stuff. That's where it gets a I uh, was, um, clusterfuck as nah, well. It'd, Man, it'd be well structured. Speaking of um, well fucking podcasts that you need to get onto this. Um, uh, Ari, like Ari Shafir's latest episode with Henry Rollins. He's um he's an ex lead singer of Black Flag, this punk band from like the early nineties and shit like that, and has since made a career doing speaking tours and, ri- and writing books and stuff like that. But um, his his podcast about some of the places that he's been in the world and shit like that is fucking crazy. And he he goes to like a lot of these places that are really war affected, and he's like, you know, take me to where there's been an election, take me where where there's been, you know, I want to see fucking. I want to go to cities. I don't want to go to like tourist places and shit like that. He's just a, a single 55-year-old dude who just, if he's got a month off his off his speaking schedule, then he's picking, you know, Uzbekistan or fucking somewhere like oh. that to go and, and have these crazy experiences and stuff like that. And he, um, the, when he starts talking about Africa, it's real fucking interesting, mm. man, because he's talking about hanging out with a lot of the... Um, uh, I can't remember their names, but like, um, like what the term you'd use for them, but the the people that go represent charities in third world countries and stuff oh, like yeah. that, and um, and between sort of meeting them and sort of getting a gauge on what type of people they actually are, and then talking with the locals and and the people that receive this sort of aid and stuff like that, and um, he I can't remember where he was in in Africa, but they were sort of asking, all right, like who's the best and um. The, everyone was saying doctors without borders or whatever and then they asked who was the worst and he said apparently excuse me said apparently world vision like they, they talk about um those guys just come over and and they get given an allowance or or whatever of what they're supposed to spend when they're there and invest this money back in and and do this sort of like charity work and stuff like that and most of these guys end up taking it back out with them and they just sort of like the whole thing is basically just like this big money making scheme and it's like fucking even charities are mm, you know yeah. are not totally infallible and it, and it, and it's sort of we'd have to come up with a fucking a really trustworthy uh you know body to distribute that money because we're talking billions and billions of oh, dollars. Yeah. Like you can't just go give it to the hands of some other charity that are going to make themselves rich and then say, oh, we didn't really have enough to get mm. to get running water to all of Africa. I so. think um, it, it would make your skin crawl if you actually found out if you donated $10 to, like, a, say, a World Vision, a, allegedly that you'd... Uh, how much of that ten dollars would actually filter through to where it needs to go? Yeah, mm. there's a lot yeah. of staff mm. that they have to pay off. There's exactly, a lot of, fees a lot of and infrastructure shit like and shit yeah, like that. So that much goes into it. it yeah. Where if you're handing over your ten dollars, it's yeah, I'm sort of reluctant to do it with some of them. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, about I give to charities. I, I usually aim at medical research. I guess I feel like that's, I don't know, as a um, 
not I guess what would you call me a consumer or at that end of sort of like a supporter I guess it's sort of the thing that I feel is like I want to support most the best target yeah. approach. targeting for, uh, approach yeah I guess war veterans and like on any sort of like Anzac Day Remembrance Day thing donate some money yeah. there I think that ends up going into like the veterans affairs or yeah. whatever like that yeah. and uh, also uh, a lot of Australian surf life saving. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. That's a that's a thing that we take for granted on our beaches too. Where if you go in and get in the shit, and if you're sort of at at the beach, like between those flags, someone's going to oh, come out yeah. and get you Absolutely. and put themselves on the line as yeah, well definitely. to get you. Definitely. And um, just growing up and knowing, sort of planning to have a family and things like that too, where you can go to a beach and swim between the flags and stuff. It's a. I think that's a. Yeah, a, uh, yeah, the, the humble brag of the week. I was at um, a beach on the Sunshine Coast once and uh, was just laying on the beach with my girlfriend at the time and saw somebody struggling like out in a sort of midsection between sort of the shorey and, and the break further out the back, real real sort of churny channel. And uh, there was a tower there, but I couldn't tell whether it was a lifeguard sitting in it or not. So I basically just ran out, swam out to this uh, this little Asian kid and um, and like helped him back on his bodyboard he had a bodyboard out there and then basically just like pushed him in and then as i was walking up the beach the lifeguards coming down just sort of like scratching the back of his head just like oh thanks bro <laughs> oh. <laughs> just, oh. yeah. Jeez, yeah, mate. But, like, uh, they're volunteers so yeah, i mean yeah. you and and you stick a lifeguard in one tower and then ask him to you know survey this whole exactly. kilometers and kilometers of beaches when people aren't swimming in between the flags yeah, like it's white, definitely it's, yeah. Worthwhile He's charity. There, um, swiping right on his fucking Tinder account. Exactly, <laughs> and, and, and because yeah. you would you would be there just doing a work shift, which would be six, seven, maybe even eight hours. Who knows? Exactly. You'd, you'd just be sitting there, and you'd be dozing off in the tower, and and or whatever, because there'd be no one swimming at that particular time, and then all of a sudden someone had just fucking something happened. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I did a few years as a pool lifeguard, mm, yeah, and it was the same sort of thing, trying to keep, uh, trying to keep the attention to really watch yeah. what was going on and not just zone out and just stand there and look at your feet <laughs> keeping an eye out for that code brown like <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was legit what, man yeah. they had it they had a code brown yeah they did yeah, they had a code yeah. code red was uh blood, blood. somebody was bleeding code blue was Some a concussion somebody passed was out, yeah. passed out or knocked out yeah um code white was just anything that needed to be brought to the attention of the um the management i called uh a, w- a code white twice once for um two uh two gay dudes like passionately making out in in the pool next to um next to the lily pads where the kids would play and stuff like uh, that yeah. i probably would have would have called the same on on a heterosexual couple yeah. passionately making out and then, uh, you, and then the other time was for somebody sniffing paint did you, did, you, <laughs> oh, <laughs> did, you, did you ever go into that splash Briss, have you yeah. ever been into that? Champside shout out, shout out, Champside Pool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you know where, like, um, the the top of the tower is where you, the two water slides would leave, and then there was the one water slide that would launch out towards Hamilton Road, and then it would sort of cu- curve around mm-hmm. at the very corner. Um, out on that corner, like, if you pretty much jumped off the edge, which I did, like, comes down into that sort of dive pool you know where they had that that sort of like yeah it's basically for anybody listening that's not quite following it's like a uh probably a three-story tower that that begins the water slide and the water slide goes out to the left before it heads down and and sort of a meter like further out from that is one of the other pools that's actually fairly deep but it's sort of like a gap so there's a concrete gap below so if you go down the very top of the slide and stop yourself Mm. you can climb up onto the edge of the slide which is leap out which is spherical by the way like and filled and filled with running water yeah, <laughs> and exactly. designed to designed to make you slide. Yeah, and uh, you yeah. you could leap out and jump. And uh, and for for listeners at home, Chris and I were both lifeguards there. He got me the job there, and uh, I remember hearing stories of him doing it. So I inevitably did it. But uh, <laughs> much to the dismay of the rest of the lifeguards <laughs> that worked with me, just shaking their head. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, one of those discipline things. Discipline reaction or anything? Or just no. Like well, this was this was at a at a sort of after hours. Yeah. boss not looking type mm. situation yeah. i remember we, we used to have these like on christmas party nights because you'd start at the at the splash aquatic center and and or allegedly there and then uh <laughs> and then and then um 
we, we would be having drinks at like Gilhooly's at Chermside. And so we would start there and we would just be given a, a, a complete leave pass on the slides to do whatever the fuck you wanted. So we would just be grabbing like bin lids and, and all sorts of shit and just like scooting down the slides. And it was so funny because the, the slides are put together in sections and then obviously the sections are then, you know, have like sort of like gap filler put in them so they're slick. But like when you go down in a bin lid, it's sort of like just... <laughs> As you just pretty much go down, just hitting these sections with fucking a bin lid. Oh shit! Oh, just ruining, gravy. ruining their infrastructure. <laughs> <I've> got <laughs> I got a bin lid, son. Yeah. Uh, oh shit! Shall we? Shall we pull it up there, boys? That's yeah. all she wrote. That. Well, that was what a wrap yeah, up. Yeah, <laughs> Sharp like a knife. Like I could just cut it. It's a really good podcast right up until that. That's point. it. We just yeah. the we, whole thing. We, yeah, we just cooked it. Anyway, we're off to uh, commence our long weekend. Thanks for tuning in. We'll, we'll be, be back next week. That's it. Yeah. Peace. Peace out, people. Bye.